Darwin's Doubt reviews a uh, second part. You may remember that last week we talked about how to review a, review a large scientific book. The first thing, of course, is to read the book, then to find the main ideas being presented, check them against your background knowledge, check them against other people's background knowledge, assess the reliability of the key points, and then try to write a balanced and fair review outlining what you know, stating your own personal biases, and uh, state your evaluation of the book. Uh, my quick summary of the book without critique uh, is the sudden appearance of multiple diverse life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin and continues to be a problem. Precursors are rare, mostly limited to sponges, which can be found in earlier strata, indicating, pardon me, invalidating the argument that creatures couldn't be fossilized in the earlier Cambrian or Precambrian, say, because they had no hard parts. Claims that the intermediates are really there are not believed by most authorities. Darwinian theory requires many intermediates. So there's a problem here. The tree of life is too shaky to support Darwinism in this area against the fossil evidence. We're going to see a direct challenge to that shortly. And punctuated equilibrium cannot explain the Cambrian explosion. New body plans require massive amounts of functional, not just Shannon information. The work of Yaki, Sauer, and Axe have made it much more difficult to explain the origin of information using Darwinian theory. Steve Meyer's article, which was retracted without good reason, has never been effectively answered. The only attempt was on the internet and flawed. Population genetics is against more than minimal changes using Darwinian processes and developmental gene regulatory networks and epigenetic information challenge Darwinism. Several modifications of or alternatives to Darwinian theory, such as self-organization, evo devo, neutral evolution, neo-Lamarckianism, and natural genetic engineering have their own weaknesses. Perhaps the most profound common weakness <coughs> is the inability to explain the origin of specified complexity or information. Intelligent design explains information well, and using abductive reasoning, it is the best current explanation for the facts of the Cambrian explosion. It accounts for generating new forms rapidly, generating a top-down pattern of appearance, and constructing complex integrated circuits and reuse of parts in different settings. Intelligent design cannot be excluded from science by definition unless the definition is either ad hoc or it also excludes neo-Darwinism. Intelligent design is based solidly on science, unlike creationism, but unlike Darwinism or theistic evolution, which are also not based solidly on science, it allows one to believe in ultimate purpose. This, while not evidence for intelligent design, makes the question important. That's a summary of the book. That's obviously not necessarily what I believe. Specifically, I would disagree with this, <coughs> unlike creationism. Um, but uh, that gives you a good overview of what uh, Meyer is claiming to support in the hundreds of pages that he has written. Now, there have been three reviews. We covered Donald Prothera's review last week. Um, Nick Matsky is the, Matsky is the person that uh, will be reviewed today. Uh, and there's the web address. And Charles Marshall will be next week, Lord willing. <coughs> Nick Matsky starts out, he entitles it Meyer's Hopeless Monster Part 2. Part 1 was uh, Matsky's criti critique of uh, Meyer's article in the uh, Biological Society of Washington. He um, starts out by apologizing uh, for uh, various uh, errors that will be in the, in the piece that wouldn't be there otherwise. I'm extremely busy finishing grad school and moving to a postdoc. I guess he's, uh, when he was writing this, he was not, had not finished his PhD, so he had not completely narrowed his uh, focus so that he didn't have the broad scope, um, at least according to Donald Prothero. Uh, 
Um, so uh, he needed to put his two cents in, and it's a rough and ready piece, so he doesn't have references. He doesn't have a lot of things that you'd like to have, uh, although he thinks that it's easy to find him with Googling. And uh, it's interesting, so he's not commenting much. This is in a post that you can comment on, of course, but he expect com expects commenters to be reasonable discussants and polite and will ban people who break that spirit. So, interesting. And, and he goes on to say this week a new book came out by Stephen Meyer and that links to the Amazon webpage. Uh, having followed the ID movement for a long time, as well as being up on the recent literature and especially in phylogenetics, he felt he had a pretty good sense of what to look for in any work. Um, and so he read through Meyer's book and he found case after case of misunderstanding superficial treatment of key issues which are devastating to his thesis once understood and complete or near complete omission of information that any non-expert reader would need to have to make an accurate assessment of Meyer's ar arguments. So he doesn't think very much of it at all. And uh, he kind of says that he was half expecting some kind of definitive, detailed, serious treatment of the issue. And Meyer has had four years since his last book and nine years since, the, uh, um, since his article in the Biological Society. He says, I was sorely disappointed. I'll hit a few of the main points. It would be nice if I had the time to write a comprehensive review, explain the issues from scratch in a phylogenetics 101 sort of way and provide detailed references. But given what my summer looks like, this is not likely. So I'll just outline what occurs to me as the most significant points <coughs> and what would occur to anyone else actually trained in phylogenetic methods who also knows something about the Cambrian explosion. If the technical uh, terms and the like don't make sense, look up wiki Wikipedia. It makes more sense than Meyer does. Um, there are 9,000 plus words. If I were to read at 100 words a minute, it would take me 90 minutes to read, clear through it, so obviously we're not going to do that. <coughs> the explosion took at least 30 million years and was not really instantaneous or particularly sudden. That's the first claim. Darwin's doubt is festooned with illustrations, mostly redrawn from other sources in a rather strange cartoon-like format, also found in other recent ID books. Of course, that's to avoid copyright infringement issues. However, there is never an illustration like these. This one, where you will notice that there is a large increase in the number of, back there, uh, classes. And there's a large increase in the number of genera, but uh, topping off after the classes are done. Um, for some reason, the phyla aren't listed, but whatever. And to see, he says, look at the trace fossils are getting more broad. <coughs> the Shelleys are getting more broad in the Timotian. Well, if you add, depending on wh whose figures you're using, if you add the Timotian and the Atdabanian together, you get 10 million years. What he wants to say is that it starts at the beginning of the Cambrian. Well, maybe it does, but it certainly doesn't uh, get full power. And here's another one that is drawn that he shows. And uh, it's interesting that most of the phyla start either in the Timotian or the Atdabanian. Uh, with the possible exception of hemichordata, and in fact, I think it chordata is now in there, and interestingly, they don't list chordata, which, uh, in other words, there's a lot of missing <coughs> phyla there. But, whatever. Now, instead, we are treated to ultra simple figures of the times, uh, the origin of phyla, which date back to at least the 1970s although they've been endlessly copied by creationists and ID proponents and remain current in those circles. The drawings like this, which show the, th the evolutionary theory, and this, which shows the reality. Well, no wonder they're drawn, because they happen to be relatively accurate. Now, the source that he gives is from uh, an ID guy 
by the name of Art Batson, but it's all over, he says. Interestingly, they don't take Meyer's own illustrations so that you can see the similarity, perhaps, and I would think that with fair use, that would be a legitimate thing to do, but whatever. The reality is that even in the most conservative interpretation of the fossil record, which relegates all of the ca classic Ediacaran fossils to the stem below, the bilateral bilaterian common ancestor, or to Nidarians, or to even more remote positions, we still have this sequence observed in the fossil record. <coughs> so before 700 million years, you have single-celled eukaryotes. Earlier Ediacaran, you have multicellular animal eukaryotes, simple sponge grain organisms. Later Ediacaran, more complexity, Nidarian great organisms. <coughs> Nidarian, if I remember right, is Hydra? No. Um, and uh, sea anemone kind of <coughs> creatures. Uh, very late Ediacaran. Simple slug grade, worm grade organisms, at least the tracks and burrows. The first ones only making surface tracks and lacking burrowing ability. Making tracks suggests the organisms have at least a front end and a back end, a mouth, anus, and gut connecting them. <coughs> They're almost certainly bilaterians. The tracks are there, the animals are not. So what do you do with that? Well, they must have been there because they made the tracks. Very late Ediacaran, the very first biomineralized skeletons, that is, Clodinia, basically a worm secreting a tube, as well as the first evidence of predatory boring. Clodinia gets no mention at all in Meyer's book, and I looked it up, and it doesn't. At the beginning of the Cambrian, we start to see more complex burrowing. For example, vert vertical burrowing through the sediment, clearly indicating worm-grade organization <coughs> and an internal fluid skeleton, that is, a coelom. The burrowing gradu gradually increases in complexity over 10 million years. Then um, in the Timochian, uh, well, the, actually the uh, beginning at the beginning of the Cambrian and then to the expanding the Timochian, small shelly fa fauna. The shells, which started very small and very simple, gradually diversify and get more complex, radiating especially in the Timotian. By the end of the Timotian, some of the small shellies can be identified as parts of larger, classic Cambrian animals. The Timotian is an utterly key period for any serious discussion of the Cambrian explosion. Unfortunately, the word Timotian, or any equivalent terminology, the detailed stratigraphy of the Cambrian is still being worked out, see Erwin and Valentine 2013 part review, does not even appear in the book. The small shelly fa uh, fauna get just one, one mentioned in the book, buried in Endnote 27 of Chapter 4. A whole chapter devoted to debunking the idea that the Ediacaran fauna is ancestral to bilaterians. See discussion of the concept of ancestral below, which Meyer makes a complete hash of. However, I would tend to agree that the evidence is not good that classic Ediacarans are within the bilaterian crown, s as much because of the late date of number four and six above as anything. So <coughs> chapter four, Meyer got right. Now, if you go to EndNote 27 of chapter four, you will not find a mention of the small Shelleys. However, if you go to chapter 4, note 39, you will find mention of the small shellies. And if you go to chapter 2, note 5, you'll find a mention of the small shellies. So there are actually two references, not just one. <coughs> it's not in the book proper, but it is in the notes. The earliest identifiable representatives of Cambrian phyla don't occur until millions of years after the small shelly fauna have been diversifying. We're now to number eight. And they tend to be taxa on the stem below the crown of living phyla rather than placeable within the crown. Trilobites are an exception. But what is often missed is that deposits like the Qingjiang have dozens and dozens of trilobite-like and arthropod-like organisms that fall cladistically outside of these respective clades. They are transitional forms. How can this fact not be highlighted? 
If you're going what, we're going to explain it a little later, um, but afterwards you may still go what. In general, the earliest Cambrian relatives of the living phyla tend to be a lot more worm-like or slug-like than most modern representatives of the living phyla. Of course, many of the living phyla are basically still worms. And the more complex living phyla, for example, mollusks and chordates, have early diverging representatives or relatives that are rather more worm-like than the better known representatives within more complex body plans. Even the earliest fish, actually, either stem group craniates, stem group cephalochordates, or stem group chordates, means primitive, if you want to put it that way, um, are basically filter-feeding worms that happen to swim. They don't have jaws, scales, limbs, a bone skeleton, or anything else that most readers would associate with the word fish. Well, they do have a backbone, or a, because uh, that's what, an chordate has to have um, uh, a cord. And the they back. have somites. Yeah, they have somites. All of this is pretty good evidence for the basic idea that the Cambrian explosion is really the radiation of simple bilaterian worms into more complex worms. That's his view of the Cambrian. And that this took place, uh, took something like 30 million years just to get to the most primitive forms that are clearly related to one or another living crown phyla and occurred in many stages instead of all at once. But the reader gets very little of the actual big picture from Meyer, or at least of uh, Madsky's big picture. Matsky. Meyer doesn't understand phylogenetics, nor modern phylogenetic taxonomy, nor their relationship to older taxonomy of the Cambrian phyla. And this is, gets very interesting. Stage one, Charles Walcott tended to lump the fossils in with various modern phyla. For example, anything that looked vaguely like an arthropod, call it an arthropod shoehorn everything into, into pre-existing phyla. Stage two, 1970s and 1980s, in this period we often see discussions of the Cambrian animals which are dominated by a weird kind of misbegotten mutant offspring caused by the attempt to fuse Linnaean rank uh, taxonomy with Hennigian thinking. Hennig is the father of modern cladistics. The epitome of the latter approach was Stephen Jay Gould's 1989 Wonderful Life. Crudely speaking for Gould, if a fossil can't be placed in a modern phylum, call it a new phylum, a whole new body plan. Well, I don't know what else you do with uh, hallucinogenia, but... Um, so Stephen Jay Gould is now officially under the bus. Um, Another product of stage one and stage two type thinking is the whole confused idea that in evolution, first we should see species level divergence, then genus level divergence, then family, et cetera, all the way up to the phylum level divergence. Yes, it does seem that way, doesn't it? Uh, Meyer is clever in finding quotes from people like Dawkins endorsing this expectation. So Dawkins is now under the bus too. Um, Although all it shows is that they are products of being trained in stage one or stage two rather than rigorous phylogenetic thinking. So if you hear stuff from Gould and Dawkins, kind of ignore it because it doesn't really, you know, they're, they're kind of old fuddy-duddies. 1980s to the present, such methods are what show that many of the Cambrian animals do not fit within the living phyla, but rather they branch off the stems below the crown groups. So they kind of sort of fit underneath the phyla is the way I think he, he would try to put it, which are now coming together, and uh, that will make more sense when we get to the very last paragraph. All of the modern work on transitional fossils is based on cladistic methodology and its successors. Crown groups, now you have some definitions. Groups defined as the clade containing two or more currently living species their common ancestor and all of its descendants. For example, the species of humans and the species of platypuses. Everything in that clade is called a mammal. A bunch of species of morphological characters placed below the crown, that is, stem groups. The key thing th about stem groups is that they have some, but not all, of the characters that make up the body plan of the crown clade under discussion. <coughs> 
Um, but body plan actually is not clear. The body plan concept is basically just as arbitrary and flexible as the phylum concept. Some lineages get more complex while others get simpler, losing characteristics found in their ancestor, for example, snakes. For more on this, see my down with phyla, so he doesn't like phyla at all. The stem group taxa are the transitional forms that Meyer et al. are allegedly looking for. See you, the missing links? Well, they're right there. I, creationists, including Meyer, usually distract themselves by focusing on names and taxonomic ranks rather than distribution, the distribution of characters. That's the accusation. Meyer is very good at misdirection. For instance, he will criticize cladistic methods for not answering the question of how new genetic information for character state changes comes about, and he repeatedly sets up body plan evolution as if it's Ivo Divo's job to explain how each phylum got its body plan from scratch or from another body plan. I think Meyer would be happy with that too. But really these approaches answer different but complementary questions. Cladistics breaks up the body plan characters and shows the basic steps that evolved in, they evolved in, and also which parts of the body plan are actually shared with other phyla. Evodiva can then work on each step, a much more manageable task, implying that if it tried to do everything from scratch, it would be unmanageable, which of course is the problem is the Cambrian actually doesn't have just stem groups but uh, pieces of crown groups. And by the way, trilobites are considered part of the crown group. Creationist thinking about the Cambrian and ID thinking, I noticed the scare quotes there, um, got all its talking points and figures from stage two in the 1980s. Part of the problem is the residual influence of the confusing nature of stage two. Many of the prominent popularizers of evolution in the last generation, for example, Dawkins and Gould, were educated in pre-phylogenetic times and do not always thoroughly grasp the implications. So you, Dawkins and Gould are thoroughly under the bus by now. Now, Meyer couldn't stumble around in the Cambrian phylogenetic literature without encountering a few of these issues. He does briefly discuss lumpers versus splitters. Be careful about those quotes from him because they're not necessarily a verb verbatim. And even Linnaean taxonomy versus rank free taxonomy. But Meyer, Meyer never presents for his readers the point that cladistic analysis reveal the order in which the characters found in living groups were acquired, nor the fact that stem taxa and the transitional fossils the creationists are the transitional fossils the creationists are allegedly looking for. Why does Meyer never show his readers anything like this? And at this point, I will say I agree with, uh, with uh, Metzke. If you look at this, this is a cladogram. And the difference between these two is a change either on this branch or on that branch or both. <coughs> the difference between these two and this one is a change at number 26. And the difference between this one and that one is a change in 25 and so forth. So you can see the closer together you are branched, the more closely related you're supposed to be. <coughs> now notice that the outgroup that's being used is Morella. Um, now here's another one, or this, and see this one is Brissy 2008, this one is Leg 2012, and um, so I thought it would be interesting to line these two up. And most of the time they're different characters, for example you'll find Limulus here, you won't find it over here. Uh, you'll find uh, Opabinia here you will not find it on this side. But there are a number of ones which are near, uh, either nearly identical in the case of Morella and Morella Morpha, which I think are the same thing, um, or that are identical, Branchiocaris, Branchiocaris. Now, it's interesting to look at this a little more carefully then because here are two different trees and of course, from an evolutionist point of view, you would expect them to come up with the same basic tree. 
Here is Yohoya, Burgessia, and Leancolia. Notice that Burgessia and Leancolia are most closely related and that Lo Yohoya has about three characteristics that have to be gone through before you can get there, maybe four. Um, well, here's Yohoya and Leancolia, and they're separated a little ways. But now, Burgessia, instead of being next to Leancolia, is down here. A little odd. Well, it gets more interesting. Here's Canadaps uh, Canadapsis, Odaria, and Perspicaris. And presumably, the two closest related are Canadapsis and Odaria, with Perspicaris being kind of out a little bit on the side limb. Well, if you go over here, you'll notice that now Canadapsis and per Perspicaria are next to each other. Whereas Odaria is up here, but he's, what's even more interesting is that in the middle of this, here's Branchiocaris, uh, which on this one is way down here, multiple characteristics separated from those. Whereas over here, the closest relative of these, although admittedly it's one, two, three, four, perhaps five changes away, is Martinsonia. Whereas Martinsonia is way down here and a long distance from those three. <coughs> now, even more interesting perhaps, Morella here is right next to whatever outgroup they finally used, or perhaps is the outgroup. Here, uh, Morella Morpha is found in the middle of all this other stuff, and the outgroups <coughs> are way at the top. Now, it does look like there's um, some difference between the two uh, cladograms. No? Well, I mean, th uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is to be expected. It just depends on which characteristics you use. Uh, and you, you can change your cladograms by what characteristics you paste. These are subjective. Uh, cladograms show characteristics. They don't show evolution. Well, but here's and, uh, the problem with that theory, is that according to evolution, there once was an actual ancestor that lived at this node right in here, because you can't, you can't transmit the characteristics unless you actually have ancestors. Well, yeah, but if you really want objectivity here, you need to compare all characteristics. You just don't select one or the other and get different cladograms. Well, but my point mm. is that the cladograms don't match each other, don't even... Well, of course, you would not expect them to get, you just select certain characteristics <laughs> for one, certain characteristics for another. But if there was an actual organism that had certain characteristics, <coughs> you kind of like to see all of the cladograms starting to, to uh, mesh together, wouldn't you? Well, you, if they were related, Yes. The, the one on the right is, is drawn upside down compared to the one on the left. That's true. Now, if you, if you put them the same, some of those features would be worse, some would be um, closer. But anyway, it, there's still a problem there. Yeah. I mean, this is not exactly what you'd call convergent tree, diagram, tree diagrams. If people tell you that, you know, all of the diagrams match, well, not exactly. Now, these, of course, are cherry-picked examples. They're cherry-picked by Nick Matsky. So what is his argument about these cladograms? He never points out the differences here. He just throws <laughs> them up and expects you to go, oh, cladograms, and your eyes glaze over and you say, oh, Matsky must be right. He can post cladograms on his uh, website. Well, <coughs> I'm being a little sarcastic, but not much. To not explain the two cladograms that you throw up, that they just don't match each other, and why not, and why you can still maintain that there were actual organisms that had the very various characteristics just does not make sense to me unless unless you're just ready to say that that uh, 
uh, cladograms don't match evolution, in which case there's no support for evolution. <laughs> Not getting phylogenetic thinking leads to all kinds of other problems. So I guess I don't get phylogenetic thinking, and we're just uh, we're going to have all kinds of problems. Meyer continually and blithely refers to organisms such as anomalocaris as arthropods, as if this were an obvious and uncontroversial thing to say. Anomalocaris falls many branches and many character stage steps below the arthropod crown group. Well, there's anomalocaris, and, and um, it's in Meyer. And let's read what Meyer actually had to say about it. Anomalocaris, literally, abnormal shrimp, and morella, for example, both had hard exoskeletons and clearly represent either arthropods or creatures closely related to them. So he does recognize that there is possibly a problem here. Looks like Ametsky didn't read Meyer very sympathetically. Meyer's treatment, mostly non-treatment, of lobopodia, which he treats as a distinct phylum. The arthropod and velvet worm phyla evolved from lobopods, and lobopods contain a whole series of transitional forms showing the basics of how this happened. Oh, lobopods. Let's look at those. Can we see exactly how lobopods were the transitional forms that led to um, arthropods? I'm not sure how you organize those kinds of things. This is from Meyer's book, of course. I'm not sure how you can say that uh, you go from lobopod 1 to 2 to 3 to, uh, to arthropods or anything like that. But Meyer does discuss briefly the crown group versus stem group issue, buried in EndNote 5 of Chapter 3. But Meyer's discussion gets the definition of crown group wrong, saying crown groups arise whenever new characteristics are, characters are added to more s simpler, more ancestral stem groups. No, crown groups are retrospectively defined by humans living in the present. Does this make crown groups postmodern? I thought Meyer's definition wasn't that bad. The living phyla are just large crown groups. Yet another confusion that Meyer exhibits re relates to the idea of ancestor. As with all creationists, Meyer exhibits no understanding of the fact that phylogenetic methods as they exist now can only rigorously detect sister group relationships, not direct ancestry. If you can't detect a direct ancestry, what does that mean? And crucially, that this is neither a significant flaw nor <coughs> any sort of challenge to common ancestry nor any sort of evidence against evolution. Maybe, but it certainly doesn't sound like it's evidence for evolution. We can say that birds descend from dinosaurs with essentially 100% statistical confidence without knowing which, if any, currently described fossils are exact direct ancestors rather than closely related sister groups. Okay, if you say so. Almost every page of Meyer's discussion of Cambrian organisms contains howlers of the first order. You want to hear a howler? First, the great profusion of completely novel forms of life in the Burgess assemblage, feature three, demanded that even more transitional forms than had previously been thought missing. E each new ex and exotic Cambrian creature, the anomalous carids, Morella, Opabinia, and the bizarre, inappropriately named Hallucinogenia, for which there were, again, no ob obvious ancestral forms in the lower strata, required its own series of transitional, transitional ancestors. But where were they? That's a howler? I mean, I, I think that what he's saying is that Anomalocaris and Morella, and maybe even Opabinia, are just simply uh, uh, ancestors on the way to getting to be arthropods. But, and so maybe all you need is one ancestor for all three of them and then it branched off at a certain point. But hallucinogenia? You don't need ancestors to get there? 
And that poof, God did it is a better explanation. I'm putting that because obviously he's not quoting Meyer, but it sure sounds like it. So if you see quotes, beware. What goes into diagrams like this, they represent summaries of the morphological character data, which in this case you can see right here. Many, uh, this is the, the second cladogram for what it's worth that they, he reposted. Many readers and virtually all creationist ideas will have little idea of the scale of effort that goes into constructing a data set like this. Almost any biological data set typically has extremely significantly si statist statistically significant tree signal. And that this is true whether or not it agrees precisely with other analyses and whether or not all relationships of interest to the researcher are precisely resolved with high support. You see, what matters is that you can reject a chance hypothesis. So therefore, our hypothesis has to be right. You can't, for example, there's no conception of there being a design hypothesis that might also be a contender. I've never seen where somebody was uh, allowed to just simply reject chance and that's the only other hypothesis. Uh, you have to ask what other hypothesis might explain the data as well. To anyone familiar with this work, it is simply laughable and pretty much insulting to see Stephen Meyer proclaim throughout his book that fossils with transitional morphology don't exist, that the Cambrian body plans look like they originated all at once in one big sudden step. Do you remember Richard Dawkins said almost precisely the same thing? Of course, now you know why Richard Dawkins has to go under the bus. Uh, they, being idealists, um, don't respect the hard work of all the scientists. Well, you respect the hard work, but you don't necessarily respect the conclusions that they come to. And most importantly, Meyer's statements don't respect the data. They don't follow the evidence wherever it leads, mostly because Meyer is ignoring most of the evidence. It seems to me that Matsky ignored a little bit of the evidence back there in, uh, in his two cladograms. Maybe the cladograms aren't as good as they are made out to be. It gets even worse when Meyer starts discussing phylogenetic conflict. Meyer's main Question. argument is basically that phylogenetic results sometimes conflict, therefore the whole thing is meaningless. Well, it may not be meaningless, but it may, be, it may not have the meaning that Matsky wants to put in. Yes? I'm listening to this and I'm watch, reading and watching it and I'm kind of, I'm puzzling how, how we get to this kind of passing of ships in the night, so to <coughs> speak, without either uh, seeing the other, so to speak. Uh, it's it reminds me of when I took a course in mycology. Up to that point, I didn't see fungi everywhere. Then I took this course in mycology and suddenly I saw fungi at every hike I went to. They were everywhere. So what strikes me is that, you see, even presenting the evidence, people do not see the evidence for what it means because they do not see it from all points of view. They only view it from a particular point of view. Thus, they're amazed that somebody else can use that same evidence to argue a different point. Yes, and this is one of the reasons that I'm bringing this up, is because I don't want these ships to pass in the night. I want them to meet. We're but, going to try to get down to the fundamental points that are being disputed, if we can. But, but what strikes me is that before the ships can actually meet, they have to want to. And, and if the major objective is to shoot the other ship down, you're not going to have much of a meeting. Well, that is true. That is true. And perhaps that's one of the lessons of this, is that uh, 
you're probably better off actually listening to your opponents than just simply uh, ignoring them. Phylogenetic methods. The inference of phylogenetic trees from character data, whether molecular or morphological, are rigorous and well tested. The easiest sort of test is computational. See, what he's saying is that these are really solid. You can hang on to them. Well, as you find out, it's not quite that solid. The general conclusion from this research is over decades is that the methods work quite well under a variety of conditions, and the areas where they don't work as well are also reasonably well known. So they don't always work. Hmm. Does that have any, th any implications for one's theory? Phylogenetic methods have also been applied to biological situations where the phylogeny is known. For example, the virus is grown in lab cultures. The method also works well in reconstructing the actual history when the actual history is known for sure by direct observation. I think he's referring to things like sheep and and uh, dogs and stuff like that. Because um, otherwise you couldn't say by direct observation. The, the thing of it is, they also can work well when you're discussing things like Corvettes. As um, Bera's blunder has shown. And those are undisputably designed. Conflict between trees is also not an all or nothing thing, unlike what Meyer ignorantly suggests. Well, I can agree with that, but it does seem like the more conflict between trees, the less likely that either tree is representing a true evolutionary sequence. If the null hypothesis, <coughs> I love this, if the null hypothesis is falsified, then you've got strong statistical evidence for quantifiable agreement between trees, whatever the disagreements might be. Just <laughs> jaw-dropping. If one data set grouped arthropods with nematodes and another data set grouped them with plants, then we'd have a phylogenetic conflict with him worth making hay over. That is, I believe, a reference to uh, Steve Meyer's drawing here where he has arthropods and vertebrates here and nematodes out there as an outgroup, which, by the way, is um, closer to plants than either of these two. But, uh, and here you have the vertebrates as the outgroup and the arthropods and nematodes together, which is his favorite, the ectisosa, ectisozoa hypothesis. Interestingly enough, we've never found this particular critter, the ectisozoa, undifferentiated. That's what we're talking about when we're saying we're missing transitional fossils. <coughs> the cladograms are basically completely empty of actual organisms below a certain level. Also, as mentioned in number one, phylogeneticists are well aware of situations that are likely to produce uncertainty and disagreement between phylogenetic trees. Here's some examples. Long molecular branches without many sister groups. So if you don't buy it, Google it. Phylo uh, phylogenies with a low number of taxa. Studies based on one or a few characteristics are also problematic. So the more ca characteristics you do, the better, which is probably true. With morphological data, the issue of clades versus grades is important to understand, as is the issue of plesiomorphy. For example, Meyer takes the paraphilia of the sponges as some sort of amazing counterexample to phylogenetic consistency. But sponges have always been at the base of the animal tree on anyone's analysis, and changing this from being one deep side branch to two deep side branches on the way to bilaterians is a, not actually an amazing change nor any huge contradiction of the morphological data. What I think he's saying is that the sponges are down at the bottom and there are two branches that go out from them. And paraphilia means that, uh, th that you should count as sponges everything, sponges and beyond, if you're being a good taxonomist. So apparently sponges are at the root of something or other. Major superphylum groups like Lophotrochozoa and Ectisozoa are robust and here to stay. It'd be nice if we had some fossils of them. It is 
quite possible for a general pattern of phylogen phylogenetic agreement to be extremely strongly statistically supported while at the same time it being true that uncertainty remains about any number of detailed issues. So see those little disagreements that we noted between the two uh, between the two cladograms? Don't worry about the differences as long as they're statistically different from zero, that's all that counts. Okay. I'm not I, I'm not sure that uh, most scientists would accept that in other fields. Um, other issues. Ironically, despite making such a hash of the key issues for dealing especially with the Cambrian fossil record and the phylogeny of animals, most of Meyer's book is about other topics entirely. Whoa. So we've been reviewing Meyer's book and we've been picking on one issue. Not addressing the whole thing. Okay, so we're going to address the whole thing. So let's move on. Instead, Meyer's main argument is really about information. Back in his signature in the cell book, Meyer asserted that the only known source of information was intelligence. This is problematic for all sorts of reasons, but one of the biggest was that intelligence is not the only known source of information. In particular, evolutionary processes of mutation and selection can produce it. Uh, Meyer's response was to argue that this didn't answer how information came about during the origin of life, which happened before there was evolution, which seems like the obvious perfect response. This actually isn't necessarily strictly true. Look up pre-evolution and anti -pros. Boy, I wouldn't want to hang my hat entirely on that kind of concept. But in any way, and noticing, he see, this is a weak, he's throwing this out as, you know, kind of almost to confuse you. Um, and anyway, the vast majority of Meyer's presentation of the information to intelligent design argument explicitly relies on the premise that information is uniquely and exclusively produced by intelligence. Actually, it's not. All it is is that major amounts of information are uniquely and exclusively produced by intelligence, uh, larger than, uh, let's say, uh, 500 bits. That's all that you really need to make the case for. You see, what he's trying to do is he's trying to set Meyer up as being brittle so that uh, one little chink out of it and the whole thing collapses. When Meyer is more like wood and you have to chop it down if you're going to do that. Meyer is now in the realm of animal evolution where there is absolutely no debate about whether or not evolutionary processes are a potential answer to the where did genetic information come from question. Perhaps so. But the important point on this is that if there is uh, information, how much information can you get from an evolutionary process that's totally unguided? And if the answer is not enough, then the whole thing collapses. As you will see later, my, uh, Matsky actually recognizes the strength of Meyer's argument. And um, we'll get into that. The Meyer's Hopeless Monster Post was a critical review of Meyer's article on the Cambrian explosion in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. We put up our critical review stating that Meyer's article was substantially self-plagiarized from his previous works. I'm not sure what's wrong with that. Was wrong on a large number of specific issues and thus could not be, well of course in their opinion, was wrong. And you can see my opinion of their opinion is not necessarily all that high. Um, and thus could not be considered a competent work of biology and because it wasn't a competent work of biology, peer reviewed obviously wasn't competent because it didn't shoot it down the way Matsky wanted it shot down. Maybe Matsky doesn't have all the answers. We never got a detailed response from Meyer, but now at long last Meyer devotes a big chunk of chapter 11 to rebutting one of the key arguments we made namely that the origin of new genetic information by evolutionary processes is well documented and well understood, and this is demonstrated by this review article that they recite. Now, I'm just going to skip over that whole issue. If we come back to it, we'll come back to it hard, um, but it deserves uh, some time all by itself. 
Meyer then switches topics to orphans. Here he repeats the usual ideas problem with complete ignorance of the relevant statistical issues involving orphans and homology searches between genomes as unfortunately can be found in some of the scientific literature on this topic. I wonder how much of the scientific literature. Maybe a majority? Uh, maybe Matsky is giving a minority opinion? It certainly would be nice if he cited his sources here. Uh, just a link, maybe? But he's too busy to do that. Meyer's last argument basically reverts to the improbability argument. Sequence space is large, functional space is small. It never occurs to Meyer that his assessment of the probability of functional sequences might just be wrong and that the deluge of evidence that new genetic information is easy to evolve is pretty direct evidence that his probability assessment is wrong. I would say it never occurs to Matsky that his assessment of the probability of functional sequences just might be wrong and that the, that the evidence that's presented in Meyer's book experimentally rather than simply saying, well, we got from this animal to this animal and therefore evolution had to do it without any uh, help from outside and so evolution can easily do it. I, I think that's a bad way to argue. That seems to me like assuming your, uh, your, prem your f uh, conclusion. Elsewhere in the book, Meyer invokes some other arguments to justify this improbability of functional sequence argument. These are Behe and Snook's 2004 argument about multiple simultaneous mutations, Behe's edge of evolution argument about chloroquine complexity clusters, and protein-protein binding sites, and work by Douglas Axe and Ann Gager. And interestingly enough, they never mention Durrett and Schmidt, which of course is the other side's admission that Behe was substantially accurate. Anyway, most of this has been rebutted elsewhere on PT, so I don't have time to do it. I don't even have time to link to it. And there's little point in doing it again. It is pretty strange, though, that most of these talking points were involved in a very similar way in last year's DI book. It's not strange. It's kind of expected that if you have a good argument, you repeat it. The rest is just a rehash of the same unconvincing material about what if multiple mutations were required. <laughs> you see you're going to get into some really rich stuff here. You're going to understand where Matsky is coming from. The multiple required mutation stuff, by the way, is basically just be he's refuted, well, by he thinks it is, irreducible complexity argument, disguised as an argument about sequence evolution, and is only relevant if it can be shown that two or more neutral mutations ever were required for anything relevant to the Cambrian explosion. <coughs> Whoa! <laughs> but as is typical in DI literature, this uh, Discovery Institute, uh, this is just blithely assumed rather than argued for. Okay. Showing it for any case would be non-trivial, and every detailed study I've ever read about multiple mutation adaptations in indicates that it doesn't usually apply. That instead, when ty what typically occurs to produce an alleged multiple mutations required an adaptation is that a variety of single-step mutations are selected as partial imperfect adaptations to some chemical or environmental stressor. I'd like to see that literature. I'd like to see a link to review of that literature. Whoa! Every detailed study I have read, I, how many of them are there? <coughs> Isn't that what Behe said, that there is no detailed study? Meyer's other go-to argument on information is basically, even if evolution can produce new genes, it can't produce protein, new protein domains. Now, be careful about those quotes, remember. He never says that. This is basically, this is... Uh, then, um, uh, and he says, A, this is basically a tacit admission on def of defeat on the information question. Not necessarily. Identical genes have the exact same information, and so you haven't created any new information. And B, there's no evidence that new protein domains were required in the Cambrian. 
I'd be surprised if any protein domains are known that are both unique to and required for the existence of animalia. Talk about faith. Whew. Conclusion. He also repeats the usual ID cocking points about junk DNA in the ENCODE project, apparently completely ignorant of the devastating responses based on huge variability in animal genome sizes, among other issues. If you can think of a theoretical reason why there might be a problem, why ignore all of the work, the actual studies that have been done. I think that the above, not just this last paragraph, but what he's all said, shows that Meyer's book is already holed beneath the waterline on the key issues of Cambrian paleontology, phylogenetics, and the information argument. I'm not sure it deserves much more of anyone's time, so don't read it. Please don't read it. The one refreshing bit of the book is at the end, where Meyer basically admits that, yes, this really is all about bringing an interventionist god back into science, and thereby reconciling and harmonizing science and religion that's not what Meyer would say. And solving the problems of meaning and culture and belonging in the universe or something. If Meyer takes his own argument at all seriously, and I think he's right about this, about Matsky is right, he is invoking divine intervention not just for the origin of life in the Cambrian, for basically every new gene, orphan, any adaptation of any significance, and some ill-specified level of morphological difference. In other words, you let the divine foot in the door, the whole body's going to be in very shortly. I think he's right about that. As I've said before, the real problem with creationist ideas isn't when they stick God into the gaps in current scientific knowledge. Such a thing is unwise, given history, but at least questions that all of humanity still wonders about are vaguely worthy of divine intervention. So it's okay to use a God of the gaps argument. Maybe a little risky, but okay. The real problem is when creationist ideas insert God into the gaps in their own personal knowledge, gaps which have already been filled by scientists. Well, yeah, maybe some scientists think they're filled. A final thought. Remember when I was talking about the STEM groups and, uh, and how he sees that there are actually not that many missing links? He'd even probably say none. A final thought, I'd like to see Meyer or his defenders explain which of the lobopods and STEM arthropods and, and arthropods in the figures above are in different genera, families, etc., up to phyla and why. I think that if you plunk those fossils down in front of an ID advocate without any prior knowledge except the general notion of taxonomic ranks, the ID advocate would place most of them in a single family of invertebrates, despite the fact that the phylogenetic classification puts some of them inside the arthropod phylum and some of them outside of it. His, his view is that there really isn't that much divergence in the Cambrian. Think about that. Now what he's saying makes kind of quasi sense. Now personally, I have a hard time putting chordates and uh, trilobites and echinoderms all in the same place. And the starfish look pretty much like they do in modern, as I understand it. Uh, but, as they say, your mileage may vary. Now, I'm going to raise four questions. Does Matsky address the central points of Meyer's book? I think in a certain way he does. He's coming at it, instead of answering the questions, I think he's coming at it by building his own base and then showing that the questions don't make sense once you build his base. Does he do so effectively? I am not sure he does. Um, is Matsky right about the transitional forms being already found? Do we need more transitional forms or not? 
Um, that's a question I think we'll have to throw out there. And the next last question is, is he right about there not being any pathways that require multiple neutral mutations to get from one useful enzyme or other protein to another? And particularly one protein that's used by animals to another. Or to get from, well, to get from one protein that wasn't, that was in the previous organisms to animals. Uh, but that's the way I view it. Now it's your turn. I think it's interesting that in this review and in one of the other reviews, I, re I recall from a few months ago of a book, that they were master students, or in this case, he's just getting his transition to a PhD. It reminds me of uh, the quote, I can't believe how smart my dad got between the time I was 18 and the time I was 25. You notice experienced people out very far, a little bit hesitant to pull off a review like this because of how badly it would make them look. Whereas when you're young and you already know everything, you're more than willing to spout off your mouth and stick it, your foot in it repeatedly. If I knew nothing about the topic, the simple number of sarcastic remarks that he makes and comments he makes would disqualify my review for serious consideration just based on the fact of the tone of the review and the comments and things he did, much less the lack of references that he had should disqualify his review fairly significantly just on technical issues, much less the facts beyond that. I, I think that that's a really good point and in fact I think that next week we're going to see a review that had to make it through peer review and you're going to see um, horns pulled back a long ways. Uh, and this is, and this is in spite of the fact that he himself talks about the need for politeness. It appears that <laughs> politeness is only expected with respect to his writing, but not with respect to what he's reviewing. Yes, there, there is that. Um, I, I find it kind of interesting that uh, he feels that everybody's wrong but us and the us is mostly himself. Um, he, he does not have, he does not have good banking. I, I might point out uh, just an uh, auxiliary comment. Some people uh, feel the Adderkin stuff is a different explosion. It's called the Avalon explosion in the yes. scientific literature. Well, and, you notice that he doesn't like to say out loud but he does kind of concede that that's the most conservative uh, interpretation, yeah. that it's a valid one. In, in terms of uh, how long the Cambrian explosion is, uh, I think we need to be careful on this. Uh, but, it, you know, it, some people boil it down to five million years. In fact, I've heard three million years uh, where they restrict. But then there are other groups that... Uh, arise before and after in the Cambrian. Uh, in, in my recent book, I was kind of generous and restricted it to uh, 50 million years, and uh, the length of the Cambrian. And right. you, you can't argue against that. Uh, uh, well, Prothero can. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> Val <laughs> Valentine would <laughs> argue <laughs> against it and so on. But, you know, just to be fair and, and so on, uh, nevertheless, this doesn't solve the problem at all. This is only 2% of the evolutionary time. And uh, how come most of your phyla power occur in this 2% and nothing happens or very little happens before and after? But you don't uh, understand. They're, they weren't really phyla back then. Yeah, well, uh, I mean... Uh, the, the, this review tells you how subjective taxonomy is. I mean, it, it's, it's a classic to explain it to you. You do whatever you want to with taxonomy. It's very subjective. What call a group, what's a family, what's a order, what's a genus, what's a species. I mean, you, 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 well, it's the, the a very problem that I decision. have is you have hallucinogenia. Whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter, <clears throat> it's there. You know, sure. and you'd expect some quarter hallucinogenia, half hallucinogenia, three quarters hallucinogenia, finally getting up <coughs> to the real thing. That's um, not there. Yeah. Uh, either that, or you have the Goldschmidt phenomenon, where 
where they just kind of popped out of nowhere. You might as well believe in creation. Yes? Could you remind me uh, of what the supposed refutation of Behe's uh, irreducible complexity argument is? Well, the answer that is given, Behe's, Behe's argument is very simple. Supposing you have something that has, to ha has 50 parts or 30 parts, um, and let's supposing that you can take out five of them and nothing happens, okay? So uh, we'll, we'll start with 50 parts, and you take off another five and nothing happens. If you just modify them a little bit, you're okay. Uh, but now you take out, you get down to a core of 30 parts. And if you remove any one of those, it doesn't happen. Well, you can't evolve to those 30 parts because there's no function until you get 29 and a half or 29 and three quarters or whatever the, the last little bit that you have to do. So there's no, there's no evolutionary direction. They are what he's calling neutral mutations. And neutral mutations can go anywhere and without guidance they're not going to get where you need to go. And I think pretty much everybody recognizes that, including Matsky. Matsky says, but look, everything has, has a direction that it's being led in and that there's no even double mutations. Well, Behe is saying, yes, there are double mutations. There are triple mutations. There are 100, there are 500, there are 1,000 mutations that you have to get to get where you're going. And it's a good argument. The only argument you can make against it is, well, actually, if you get 15 mutations, that's useful for something else. 10 mutations, that's useful for something else. The problem is, what you have to do is you have to construct a pathway that gets you all the way from 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way out to 30. And you have to have a purpose all the way along, and you have to have the purpose making it <coughs> more advantageous to be more complex the whole way. Now, Matsky knows this because he wrote an explanation of how the flagellum could have evolved. The problem is there are no creatures with 15 of them. There are no creatures with 17 of them. And there is no... There is no demonstrated benefit. It's all hypothetical benefit. Maybe it could have happened in some particular environment. That's not science. That's speculation. The hard science would be, okay, so we need to, something with, let's say, 28 of the 30 proteins to work. Uh, I think, well, let's put it in the test tube and let's see if it actually works. And if, uh, maybe it's advantageous for sticking to stuff, okay? So let's put it somewhere where sticking to stuff is an advantage. Uh, it's an awful lot of work to show that, Ma that Matsky is correct. It's going to be even more work to show that he's incorrect because if you show that it isn't sticking to stuff, well, maybe it's mating. Well, maybe it's something else, you know, and you can chase hypotheses f from one end of town to the other. The, the point of it is, it's what is known in the software industry as vaporware. There ain't no such animal. And that's the real problem. And that's the problem with the transitional forms. Matsky has convinced himself that, in fact, those forms are always there. Whether he can see them or not, they're there. They're there because evolution needs them to be there. And evolution is true. And you don't need more proof. In looking at his trees that he did, that was chordate trees? What was that? The uh, I think those were mostly um, uh, was arthropods. Because if you looked at the bottom of I mean, one of them, it had insects. It had a hexapoda, for example. But if you, if you make the argument 
legitimate that while they're looking at different characteristics, are you saying then that when they, they lost the characteristics that, you know, if you're going to say, well, that we just didn't look at the characteristics in this tree when we looked at this tree, but even if you say that, they had to have an ancestor and that ancestor had to lose some of those characteristics so they would have been picked up in the next one to a degree. So they can't conflict that much. Even if you're looking at different characteristics, they shouldn't be widely variant because some of those characteristics are going to, they shouldn't lose them going down that line, right? The, the yeah, I, I agree The ancestor should carry through on both lines of looking at it. And so they should start to look more and more. In fact, the more characteristics you pull out, they should start to become one tree. In fact, there's a paper in the peer-reviewed literature, so it must be correct, that argues that, um, that argues that walking sticks lost the ability to fly and then regained it 42 times. If you follow the cladograms, that's what you have to do. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> we need to keep in mind, the characteristics you pick for your cladogram determines your cladogram. This is a very subjective uh, feature of cladograms. People are impressed with you know how impressive these things are. You can make cladograms of anything, uh, whether it's including uh, designed objects. Well, sure, like women's hats or refrigerators or cars or whatever you want. I mean, you can make cladograms, and they look very impressive, but they don't evolve from each other. And you need to keep that in mind. Well, uh, the question is, do they evolve or not? And that's the question that Nick Madsky, I think, is having a hard time actually asking himself. Of course mm -hmm. they evolve. Everybody knows they evolve. So why are we wasting our time on this? Let's just get to the cladograms. And there's a lot of work because you have to look at this object and does it have this characteristic, and this object and does it have this characteristic, this object does it have this characteristic, and then when you get all done with all of those characteristics, you put them into a computer and you see what comes out. So it's a lot of work. It is. Sure, it's impressive. Uh, I uh, I don't know if anybody else noticed this or not. Um, but I, I was impressed there were several times there where he was saying that this point is wrong because you're disrespecting the number of people that have already come up with this idea. It seems to me that the number of people has nothing to do with it. He says you can, you can test a theory by computation. I never heard such a thing as testing a theory by computation. This seems to me to be all like, you know, got to get in the club and get with the thing and, and, and it's all proved out. Um, I think that that's a valid criticism. I, to me, uh, testing it by computation is that um, it might help to prove something wrong. It's difficult to prove something right. I think we've had some experience of that recently with computer models that don't uh, tell you exactly where, for example, the world temperature is going to go. Uh, what I said last week has a lot of... Uh, appropriate application today. <clears throat> Some of you weren't here, so I'll repeat it a little bit. One of my professors at George Washington University in invertebrate paleontology, and that's dealing with a lot of what we see here. They're mostly invertebrates, right? Um, he made the statement that when you go to the bottom of the Cambrian, you have separate discrete phyla, and you you, all you have is dotted lines. You don't have any transitional forms or intermediates. Now, that was based on a class I had over 30 years ago. Yeah, but he was a creationist. And <laughs> you'll spoil my <laughs> argument. <laughs> His colleagues called him a creationist. He was totally a secular Jew. Uh, religion didn't have any bearing on what he was coming up with but it was based on his 50 years of experience prior to that. He was about ready to retire. And so I'm surprised, or not surprised, that the picture hasn't changed that much, at least according to Meyer. You still have discrete phyla. You, now, you can maybe find few transitions here and there. And that's OK. That's on a micro scale. And even creationists allow for micro change. You know, 
beyond maybe even a ge genus. You read uh, Harold Coffin's book. Uh, family is a and common family. way of putting it. You could have it even beyond the family. So um, anyway, so maybe Stephen Meyer goes too far in saying no, absolutely no transitional. The transitionals that we see <coughs> are just minor. <coughs> they don't get you from one phyla to the next, right? I, I think that's a fair way of putting it. Yeah, that's, that's my summary. Just to add to that, if evolution had actually taken place, after you've looked at millions of fossils, you would expect a solid continuity between major groups. There's not that solid continuity there at all. It, the various organisms do tend to fall into discrete groups. The further down you go, it's still the same story. Um, at the risk of throwing more fuel on the fire, uh, uh, when, when I was looking at the uh, fossils uh, in, on our trip to, to the shale um, up on the mountain, do you remember? W were you there? You Did you go? Burgess yeah, Burgess, Burgess shale, shale, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. It struck me as I was looking at those um, fossils, how would we know if those fossils actually represented the larval forms of some organism? Without we, seeing we would the critters, have, you wouldn't. If you have never seen the different stages in the life cycle of an organism, you have no way of connecting them. So you could have apparently very different looking organisms <coughs> who are actually the same organism just at a different point in its life cycle. Well, you know, the caterpillar is, to use his phrase, a, a, a complicated worm. <laughs> but, yes, but do you see the point I'm trying to make? I mean, when you're looking at mere fossils of something you have uh, and then you're de developing these cladograms on their particular appearance in that fossil you you're basically only making a single snapshot of one time point and you have no idea of what that organism really was and what it did Oh, you're right. What would be fascinating is to do a cladogram of caterpillars and a cladogram of butterflies uh -huh. and see if they matched. <laughs> <laughs> it would be most interesting. Uh, I mean, this would be an interesting exercise, but I don't know of anybody who'd ever attempt such a thing. If you pick the right characteristics, you'll get it to match. If you pick some other characteristics, you'll get it to be very different. It just depends on which characteristics you pick for a well, cladogram. What that means is the cladogram has nothing to do with uh, actual trees. That's the point I'm trying to say. Cladograms do not mean evolution. They mean analysis of characteristics, highly sophisticated analysis of characteristics. It's very impressive uh, statistics involved in it and so on. But know what it's doing. It's according to what characteristics you select. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, Really, if you really want to test it out, you should use all characteristics you can possibly think of. Uh, then you might have some significance. But as long as you keep ch cherry picking what char characteristics you use, uh, cladograms can be very subjective. I come from the outside. I am amazed at the things these people invent so they can get rid of God because God says we have to obey him. <laughs> well, I. I have to agree with you, I, uh, and and I think that it's very interesting that he's just desperately wanting to blame all of Meyer's opinions on the fact that he needs God, when it's probably fair to say that Meyer can allow God as a hypothesis, and once you do that, it just jumps out at you. Also, my observation is kind of similar. It's on the outside because I don't 
I don't really have expertise in Cambrian evolution. But um, when you develop these cladograms and construct them on a screen or in a book or in the laboratory, that's an example of intelligence at work. And so you have intelligent design of cladograms. But then you turn around and de deny that there can be any intelligence out there and it just happened by chance. That, to me, that's the, <laughs> the greatest discrepancy possible. I think right? on that note, we will end. Uh, if you come back next week, we'll see an actual peer-reviewed review, uh, and uh, it will be um, interesting to contrast the two styles of review, peer-reviewed and not peer-reviewed this week and last week, being not peer-reviewed. <laughs>